G'day legends and welcome to this episode of the Cricket Mentoring Podcast. I'm here with a very special guest, Australian cricketer Nicole Bolton. Bolts, thank you very much for joining me. No worries, thanks for having me. Um, now guys, if you don't know too much about Nicole's career, she's played three test matches for Australia, 50 one-day internationals with four centuries, highest score of 124, and an amazing average of 41.21 and two 2020 internationals. So before we get into Bolts, congratulations on everything you've achieved so far. Thank you. And hopefully plenty more to come. Now, with this podcast, it's, it's a bit about your life and your journey, and um, I, I usually take our guests back. How did you first get into cricket? What are your earliest memories of playing cricket? Um, I think earliest would be, I had two older brothers, so they were playing cricket um, from a young age, and I think um, it was just sort of something that I got involved with through them in the backyard. Um, and then I really didn't take it on as an actual sport and being competitive with it until I was about 15. So in actual fact, uh, I was quite late into the sport. Um, obviously, I was exposed to it at a really young age, but didn't really take it seriously until, yeah, a bit later. What were you doing up until 15? Were you playing other sports? Yeah, so I was really big on netball. Um, I played a lot of tennis as a junior, so I think um, netball and tennis were probably my two chosen sports. Um, and obviously back then, cricket and um, girls getting involved, we didn't really have that exposure, so there was no real direction. So um, I basically chose sports that I guess more females and, and girls were playing at the time. Yeah, and obviously netball, agility and movement and catching and throwing and tennis, the same sort of thing, would have really helped your hand-eye coordination and everything. At 15, what was the turning point that made you decide to get into cricket? Um, the school that I was at, MLC, um, they had a girls' cricket uh, program and um, it was involved in, uh, I guess, a school girls' competition. Um, and Helen Andrews at the time was uh, the coach and she was actually involved with the Western Fury playing women's cricket um, and then obviously club Subiak O'Mara. So uh, she sort of got me involved at MLC in that competition and then got me down to training at Subi Myris. And I think um, from then on, I um, sort of rubbed shoulders with Angel Gray and Avril Fay, so um, two of the stalwarts playing for the Western Fury. And um, yeah, they sort of got me involved and um, yeah, pinpointed me to get um, into like the underage state champs and stuff like that. So you are from the time you started playing, obviously with the, the history of your brothers who were both good cricketers, I played a bit against Dave, um, you were a pretty good player when you got to the fifth, to 15 and playing competitively and they recognised that straight away? Yeah, I think um, I just remember as a 15 year old um, playing for Subi Myers, I came in at number six and that was like a pretty big deal back then because there were some, you know, really good players playing and then when I eventually went to the underage stuff, um, I sort of bypassed the 17s and I just played 19s as a 15 year old and that was literally like the level that I played at. So I was always exposed to playing with, um, I guess, people that were older than me and um, I guess that sort of fast tracked my development in the sport as well. Awesome. Now you've, you've made a career as an opening batter. Um, I can't imagine your older brothers would have let you bat too much in the backyard. How did that all come about? How did you become such a good batter? Yeah, I think um, it was funny actually because they would bat and they would know that I would just throw balls to them all day and field and do all that. But um, yeah, I don't know. Like I just remember going around like when Dave and Ad played at Hale School, um, you know, I would take a ball and bat down and I'd just get all the blokes to, to throw me balls and just hit. I just loved it. Like it was just something that... I really enjoyed um, and then yeah I'm not really sure where the opening bat came I think it was just sort of in our family I mean dad was an opening bat Dave and, and Adam were and I guess it was just something that I pinpointed as I really enjoyed the opportunity to to bat all day um, so yeah I guess that's where it came from. Well you've got good heritage or pedigree I suppose with all the, the father and the brothers and like I said Dave was a very good cricketer and a a wily bowler. Yeah. Um, he must have challenged you in the backyard a bit. Yeah, yeah, he did actually. Um, when we moved house, we actually um, had a really good sort of um, track that we could play backyard cricket on. And, um, you know, he wasn't short of actually snipping me a few times with the tape tennis ball. And the issue was, so I would obviously, I'm a left hander, so the offside was opened up. And if I was to play on the leg side, it was straight into the house. So 
it actually um, developed my offside game because that was the only way I could score. Yeah, amazing. And is that, has that carried on throughout your career? Do you find that you're a much better offside player in, in your career now? Well, I one of the shots that like a, I feel like is a strength is the cut shot. And obviously Dave's pretty tall and so he, he wouldn't give me too many opportunities to drive the ball down the ground. So I think I sort of developed my back foot play in the backyard. Yeah, it's amazing how many stories there are like that where... You've got if you hit it through a certain gap, that's four or six runs, and players become great at that shot in their international careers. So incredible how you can sort of trace it back to the backyard. Yep. Um, so take us back. You're 15. You've been fast tracked, and you're playing with the, these fury women. Um, when did you decide this is something you want to do? When did you decide cricket is something you want to pursue and you love? Um, well, I think as a as a 15 year old, um, I was sort of thrust into the fury environment as and um i didn't really know that there was that um opportunity out there and i guess i I was a little bit naive and i just was you know a young kid and i was playing sport and rubbing shoulders with some of these older women that were really really good and uh, i think when i made my debut at the wacker as a 16 year old i was sort of like oh geez like this is pretty cool like this could be something that i actually want to do and um I'm pretty good and um, yeah I don't really know like where I want to go with it but right now it just feels right um, I'm still playing a lot of other sports as well like I, I've got a massive passion for sport in general so I didn't really want to say that cricket was going to be it from that age I made sure that I was still exposed to all the different types of sports um, but yeah I think when I sort of made my debut um, and and sort of held my own I was you know, pretty certain that maybe this is the direction I was going to go down. Amazing. So 15, you start playing. 16, you, you make your debut. That's, there's probably not many cricketers in the world who have progressed so quickly. Um, what was what was the reason? Obviously, you said you got fast-tracked to the 19s, but was it that you were scoring runs for Subi Maris or were you sort of a bit of a developmental player at that stage? What, what got you picked in that WA side? Yeah, I think, um, I mean... Avril Faye was the, the captain at the time and obviously I was playing um, under her at Subi Morris and I think, um, you know, she really pushed my case and, um, you know, wanted me involved and, and obviously thought I could handle it and um, saw something. And I guess I was a bit of a de- development player. Like when I first made my debut for the Fury, I, I was batting at, I think, nine. Um, I was actually bowling more than batting and I just loved field, fielding. Like fielding was just something that... I was always able to hold my own and I was just like a little terrier out there. Like, Which I just I, loved it. I bet goes back to the being one bat, brother batting, one brother bowling. You're in the yeah, yard playing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think from that sense, I, I could hold my own. Um, and, you know, maybe back then a lot of people were a little bit, um, oh, is she ready? Like, um, are we putting in too soon? Um, and then obviously with my parents, there's always that risk of, you know, like I'm a 16 year old going into an, an adult environment, like can, can I hold my own? Like there was a lot of those sort of questions, I guess that were being asked, but um, yeah, I, I never once sort of was felt, felt out of place. Mm. Something that interests me is you're the youngest of your sort of th- three of you. They say that there's a fair bit of research that the youngest often becomes the most successful, especially in a sporting sense, because they, they're hungry, they try and strive to outdo their, their elder siblings. Was there some of that in you when you were growing up, do you think? Did you want to try and beat your brothers or get to the level of your brothers? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, without... I, I think that Dave had really untapped potential because um, I thought he was an amazing cricketer and he, and he, sh- he showed that in his... I mean, he's still playing now in the Wagga lead and he's, you know, almost 40. So um, I just felt as though, like, he could have really gone far with his cricket and... I think for him, um, he just didn't have that, you know, he had other things in his life that were important to him. And I think I sort of took on um, that next sort of level to actually really want to push myself. Um, and Adam was a little bit more, like, he, he liked playing it just because he was with his mates and he was, you know, he did it at school. And so I think from that point of view, like, I always wanted to sort of stretch myself and I was playing competitively, like netball and tennis. So I sort of, um, was able to have those, um, you know, motivation to actually want to push myself and be the best I can be. Mm, amazing. Now, women's cricket in general, when you first started, I imagine it would have been about 2005, what was the landscape like then? Were those 
excellent players you've already mentioned, were they professional? Were they earning a living or was everyone having to work at, the, at that point in time? Yeah, everyone was having to work. I think the only costs that um, were covered were flights and accommodation at the time. So there was no money involved and a lot of um, the trainings was obviously after work hours and it was, you know, sort of a commitment that allowed those sort of players to be able to work full time. Um, so it was, yeah, the landscape was a lot different. I remember I used to get quite embarrassed actually saying I played women's cricket because um, people were like, why are girls playing cricket? It's a, it was a male dominated sport back then. So mm-hmm. I almost didn't like to say that I was actually doing it. Um, yeah, because I just think that like there was a bit of a, what do you call it? Uh, people just had this perception about it. Mm-hmm. So um yeah, it sort of took me a while to actually acknowledge what I was doing and actually talk openly that I was playing cricket. Mm, that's amazing. And we'll get onto the, the progression of women's cricket a little bit later, but it, what a fascinating sort of time to have played. You had your career from the start then, 2005 or whenever it was, um, th- through to now and, and what's just happened recently with women's women's cricket in the World Cup. So amazing that you'll be able to look back and say you, you were there at sort of the, the transition period, I suppose. Now, how important have your mentors been throughout your career? You've spoken about your brothers and your dad. Um, this might be a chance to thank a few people, but who, who, who's played a significant role in your career and how important have they been? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, who I've touched on earlier is um, Helen Andrews getting me involved in the sport from the start. Um, and then, obviously, Angel Gray and Avril Faye sort of nurturing me as a young pup coming in through Subi Myris and then even taking me under their wing during that um, early days of the Western Fury. But... Yeah, I think I've done a lot with um, Noddy Holder. So um, I just remember Dad got me involved with him when I was maybe about 16, 17. Um, and even to like even today, like I still see Noddy, um, particularly during the preseason when I do a lot of volume work. Um, he's just been not just a batting coach, but more of a life coach. I think um, you probably know Noddy. He's just. He just sees things differently and I think exposes you to um, different ideas and I think I really value um, his opinion. So being able to work with someone like him away from the, the whack of bubble has actually been um, really helpful in my career. Yeah, I think, I, th- I think, and I obviously run cricket mentoring, but I think there's a lot of value in having someone outside the system to go away and chat to and not be influenced by the system, which obviously sounds like you agree with. Now, you made your ODI debut at the age of 25. You started playing first class or for, for WA at 16. What did those nine years look like? What, did, what were you doing with yourself throughout that period? Yeah, it was a really interesting journey actually because um, I guess I was playing a lot of cricket from a young age. So when I was 15, 16, I was playing under 19s. I was playing club cricket and then the Western Fury stuff. Um, and then on top of that, I was in high school, so I was, um, you know, getting through 10, 11 and 12. So there was a, a lot happening in my life. Um, and then obviously when I got to about 18, I was um, picked in a, like an under 23 Australian um, mm. tour. And we actually went to New Zealand. Um, and that was my first exposure um, in any sort of Aussie program. And I hadn't really done too much to, to warrant that, but it was almost like I was the token WA. With, they needed to get someone in. So, um, And I just remember being away on that tour and, um, you know, and even the Aussie girls were there because they were there for a tour. And some of the girls in the Eastern States, I was like, they were seriously fit and they were seriously talented. And I was just like, I am so far back at a, a level that is required to, to play for Australia that it's not even funny and I think from that moment what I did is I really pushed hard with my my fitness and my training probably a little bit too much um, and that sort of succumbed to me experiencing early early stages of burnout at, um, from a young age and I think my love of and passion of cricket really um, wasn't wasn't there I think I yeah I pushed it really hard and then for how long are we talking a six month or a two year period or yeah well I ended up taking two years out of the game and I think as a as a young player that's a significant amount of time I remember I was um picked to go on a camp to Brisbane and I rang um, Mark Jennings who was a selector and I said I'm not going I'm, I'm actually not playing cricket anymore and she was a bit like what do you mean like 
And then I was just like, I, I don't like it. I don't want to be involved. And so I stepped away for two years and um, it just was all too much. And uh, Steve Phillippe was our coach at the time and I remember telling him and I was just like, I, I was just making poor, poor decisions. I just remember like I just sort of was burnt out so I was not rocking up on time um my training standards were dropping and I just didn't have you know, I was just letting people down basically and during that two uh two year hiatus I ended up taking up um AFL and sort of um yeah wanted to be involved in a different sport get away from cricket um and and try something new and I think that's what was really good for me is like I realized during that time that I still wanted to be involved in cricket in some capacity so after the the two years I came back and yeah I wasn't sure if I was going to come back to be honest like I was rubbing shoulders with some people um off like away from footy and cricket that weren't a good influence on me so um as any young kid when you're what 18 19 20 like can make some pretty poor decisions and I think that's where I was at and um yeah and then I think once I decided when I was uh, about 23 is when I came back in and played for WA um I remember sending an email to Steve Philippine saying yeah I'm ready to come back um I know I'm not like guaranteed a spot but um yeah I want to get back and involved but during that whole time I was still playing a little bit of club cricket um and yeah I actually came back and ended up captaining the side so <laughs> the transition was straight back into captain yeah I had, I had one year off and then I literally transitioned into captaincy when I was um 23 wow. yep um so there's so much information there it's just trying to process it all so it sounds like you went on that under 23s tour you realised you were off the pace and you thought, I've got to lift my standards here and you went too hard, too much and that just was the reason you burnt out. Um, then you went and had some time away and obviously I'm sure WA and Australian cricket is very relieved and thankful you got back into the game after that. What was it like then? You came back, you were captain and then a few years later you made your, your uh, international debut, your ODI debut. Did you have the love of the game back then? Yeah, I think so. I think I wanted to be back and obviously taking on a leadership role with the captaincy, I felt um, I could take the team in a direction and that might actually help my cricket as well. And um, yeah, I think it was something that actually, um, I guess, yeah, made me perform like under pressure. And, you know, I was opening the batting, I was captaining and I just all of a sudden started churning out the runs. Like I think I had two back-to-back seasons where I was like leading run scorer and I think they can't they sort of couldn't ignore that um because I played against Victoria and at the time Catherine Fitzpatrick was the coach of Australia but she was also the coach of Victoria and it was weird back then (laughs) so I made 100 in front of her and I think uh, she finally realized that oh like who, who is this who's this person from WA and um yeah I just decided like to to sort of make my stance out there and, and really own it. And I think I had a really good um, group of players. Um, Steve Jenkin took on um, the reins of being the head coach um, and he was he was really pushed me to, to actually get something out of my ability. And I think that was the first time as a coach that um, he... He had a massive influence on my career. Amazing, and and with this sort of with this sort of content, this could be viewed in twenty years by by a young girl wanting to play cricket. What was it like for you then? Were you a full time professional? Were you earning enough to survive, or did you have a part time job or something else on the side as well in the in the winter? Let's say. Yeah, I, well, as soon as I left um, school, I was basically working and playing cricket, and that didn't really change until um, maybe. Th- three years ago um, when I just decided to actually the money was good enough to be a full-time professional cricketer so up until then I always worked and that was what was important to me and a lot of people say oh how can you fulfill your potential if you're not putting all that time and effort into your sport but I actually feel like I work better the other way Um, when I'm there it's a little bit more about quality than quantity and having that space and um, awareness of myself away from cricket actually was a a good thing don't get me wrong it was hard because you still for me like I was captaining I was 
opening the batting, I was trying to perform and then train. So it was quite draining as well. Um, but it was during that time I was working at um, the Fremantle Dockers Football Club and I think it was just a really good environment for me to be involved and just sort of complemented playing cricket as well. Awesome. Now, 23rd of January 2014, tell us about that day. <laughs> ODI debut. Oh, yeah, I, I just remember the day before I found out that I was going to play. Um, I'd obviously had a bit of heartbreak early doors, missing out on my home test match. Um, ended up being 12th and running the drink, so I was sort of feeling like my debut for Australia was going to take a, a long time or it might never come. And, and then the second ODI, they decided to make a change and um, got my opportunity, so mum and dad came over. Um, mm-hmm. And Jodie Fields, the, the captain at the time, presented my cap, um, which was really special because it was on the hallowed MCG turf, and Mum and Dad were there, and um, it was an Ashes series, so it was a it was a big game. Um, and then I just remember like Meg won the toss and we were batting, so I went to go and have a hit up in the nets, and then I broke my bat. So, <laughs> uh, and I had not, not a good omen for any batter. No, and I hadn't knocked in a second one, so I'm a I'm a bit of a like weirdo when it comes to bats like I like will hit use one bat until it's literally dead like um so I was a little bit nervous because I was like well now I've got to use another bat and I haven't knocked it in so I was having a little bit of a freak out um and then yeah I don't really remember too much of the innings but I do remember I got dropped twice um so I actually had a bit of luck on my side you need a bit of luck, don't yeah you? and I sometimes I look back and I was like if if those chances had been taken, you know, my career could have looked really different. Um, what do you remember what you were on when you got dropped? I think I was, it, I would have been on 40 at one stage and like real early doors, like just under 20 in the first. Right. Um, but yeah, it just, I just remember Alex Blackwell saying to me when I was warming up in the nets and she was like, you are so ready to make your debut. Like I was 25, you know, I'd, put together back-to-back seasons and was churning out the runs. So, you know, I knew I had the game to be able to do it. It was just could I hold my nerve um, under that different sort of pressure. Um, and, yeah, I guess I, I never really looked back. I sort of made that position my own and, um, you know, ended up um, playing, yeah, 50 games for Australia. Amazing, and it's amazing how one little thing from sort of someone you respect or a senior player, coach, mentor, and can. And there's so many people that have said that throughout their careers that one person said something and it just gave them the belief they needed. Um, so 124 off 152 balls on their boot, and, and who knows, like you say, if you, if those chances um, had it been taken, what would have happened? However, things happen for a reason, um, and good players make make the most of their opportunities. So congratulations on that. At the time, it might still be. I'm not sure. The highest score by an Australian woman in an ODI. Is that still uh, on debut? On yeah. debut. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What a what a great um, achievement. Now, what was it like after that? You then probably realised a childhood dream or a dream of yours, and you are then a fully fledged member of the Australian team. What was that sort of part of your life like? Yeah, it was um, a bit of a whirlwind, really, because um, yeah, I, you know, it was your on your wildest dreams that you get to play for Australia let alone make a hundred on debut like not too many people get to do that and um, it just really set up my career because one it just in an ashes against a really good opposition it showed that you know I could do it Um, and then obviously like having the backing of um, my team as well gave me a lot of confidence that um, you know I could go out and, and replicate that as well and and be a bit of a mainstay in that team and I think um you know, at the age that I was, I had I had a lot to offer and I had a bit of experience. So I think that always helps. And I definitely wasn't taking anything for granted because I always see the value in, um, you know, for me, being a bit of a late bloomer. I think if I had been um, involved in the setup at a really young age, I don't think I would have had, um, I would have been a little bit naive and probably taken it for granted. So I think in, in terms of making my debut later and the experiences that I'd had over my career so far uh, actually held me in really good stead. Yeah, and so when you came home, I suppose, after that series, had life changed? Did you give up your job or did you sort of start to think differently about yourself? Did you have more belief and confidence in yourself because you'd achieved that or was everything just sort of business as usual? Yeah, it was just business as usual. Um, I just went back into my job um, 
and yeah, it was just sort of like I'd just done this amazing thing and then front up at the office the next the next day. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't a contractor player then, so I was um, sort of on the outer um, and I got a little bit of an upgrade, but nothing that was really substantial enough for me to give up work. Um, so yeah, I, I sort of was just filtered back into doing everyday things and um, in the hope that maybe the, f- the following season I could um, get a main contract. And when did that first come? Um, it came when I was 26. So obviously after that, um, that season, I um, you know, played in that Ashes and then the following season I got um, a contract. So even then it still wasn't really... Um, enough for me to, to stop work. I mean, even as a 26-year-old, um, if I was living at home, that would be great, but I wasn't. i moved out of home since I was 25, so um, I've always had to sort of had enough money to, to be able to survive, but mm. um, a lot of the girls during that age were, were living at home or even younger and studying, but mm. I'd finished my degree. I was moved out of home and I was working um, full-time as well. It's amazing the difference between men's and women's cricket at that point in time, and it's shifting. Obviously, we'll talk again a bit more about this shortly. But what what did you study, and when was that? What part of your life was that? Uh, that was during my two year hiatus. Um, I, th- I just remember I didn't want to do anything, but if it wasn't for my brother Adam telling me get your uni degree, if, if there's anything that you're going to do during this time, just do that and um, it took me four years to to do it I did event and sport rec management so at ECU so um, basically as soon as I left school um, I sort of started my degree but I was just doing a couple of units here and there because I was trying to play cricket and then yeah when I wasn't playing cricket I sort of knuckled down and actually um, actually finished it so um, from that point of view and like I was saying like when I got to play for Australia uh, I sort of had no like I had quite a bit of experience like I had my degree I, I was working so um, and I was living out of home so I developed like a lot of life skills mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now things were good you're playing for Australia you're doing well and then a little while later you took some time away from the game you spoke about burnout you'd already had a stage in your career which you just shared with us about burnout at a younger age and you took two years off the game at this point you're living your dream you're playing for australia what was that like and and what what was the sort of the, the trigger or the things that that made you step away from your spot in the australian team and cricket for 12 months yeah it was um I sort of look back on and that and I, I feel like it was a, a slow burn to get to that. I think um, there was definitely a significant event in my life where my partner and I had broken up. We'd been together for five years. We'd just bought a house um, and, yeah, and it just ended it quite abruptly, um, and not on my part. So I think from that point of view, um, I was a little bit taken aback and not ready for that amount of change. So I think from then on, um, I, I sort of wasn't okay, but the issue was I was, I was still playing for Australia and I had two, two tours that I'd been picked for. So they were um, a Pakistan series in Malaysia, which was then going to roll into the T20 World Cup in the West Indies. So um, prior to that, I'd, I'd made a commitment to... Um, Lancashire cricket to, to play in their um, T20 league um, in the hope that I'd play good enough cricket to be picked for the World Cup and um, during my career I've never really played um, any amount of T20 cricket I've sort of been pinpointed as a 50 over cricketer um, so I was sort of really hell-bent on changing that perception of my game and but at the same time I was experiencing a breakup so I thought I'd go I'd still go to the UK, it'd be a good change of scenery. And it was actually like the best experience, like it was so good. But then obviously I had to come back into the environment and um, my partner was, well, my ex-partner was involved in that environment. So that presented a lot of challenges for me because when you're on tour, you're literally like in each other's pockets. And this was like a six to eight week tour. So um, I guess I was suppressing a lot of my emotions around um, the whole thing and then ha- how do I deal with 
being in the same environment as her and having to play cricket. Um, there was just a whole range of emotions. Um, and then away from cricket, um, nothing had really been sorted. So like the house was still going on and we were making decisions around that. So effectively, like my life was a little bit in, it felt like a little bit in turmoil. Um, and as a, as a professional sports person, you just have to front up, smile for the cameras, do your job, and then deal with all that behind closed doors without anyone really not going on. Is it? Yeah, well, and, and that was the thing. Like I'd sort of put a lot of my emotions and I guess you call it the grieving process when you break up with someone on hold for 12 months. And the issue was I wasn't getting a break because um, I had to deal with it um, for the Malaysia series, I had to deal with it for the World Cup, and then I had to deal with it again for the Big Bash. So it was kind of like I just couldn't escape. And that was that was a trigger for a lot of other things that I probably were experiencing as a person um, for years. And I think... Um, Did it bring back how you felt about the game and about yourself previously to make you have a break? Yeah, like I just was, um, I just was blaming cricket again. I was just like, I, I hate cricket. Like, what am I doing? Like, I don't want to do this. And and then the two years that I had off, um, you know, I was sort of experiencing same things. And um, I don't think I was very healthy back then either, because obviously, like my decision making and people that I was hanging around with um, weren't having a great um, effect on me. And I think over that time, like, I sort of got back into cricket and then I was like, well, there's my purpose again. Like, I'm playing cricket, I'm doing well, and everything's just falling into place. Like, you know, you make your debut, you make a 100, and then it keeps going, and then you find someone and then you're in a relationship and everything's, like, good, which means that stuff that I was probably experiencing as a young adult gets sort of shoved aside. aside. Yeah, and I think it wasn't until I experienced heartbreak that um, I sort of was like, well, I'm actually not well as an individual. Um, but you don't really see that when you're in the environment because, like you say, like you're fronting up to work, I'm getting paid, this is my job, and you've got to find a way to get through it. Um, but it just got to a point where it just something had to give. Mm. And so you spoke openly in... Uh, previously about finding yourself outside of cricket in that 12 months you obviously had a bit of depression and anxiety and other things going on but what did what did you and you spoke about an intervention did you speak to someone what were the steps you, you took and what did you do in that 12 months yeah I um I engaged heavily with our coach at the time Lisa Kitely um she was quite an important person during that and our um wacker doctor Tom Hill so I think um, we all knew that something wasn't really making sense, but um, we just thought it was burnout. So Lisa had sort of <clears throat> made a decision that I would, um, you know, not train during the weeks. Um, I'd just kind of rock up to the game. Like, this is during the big bash season. And if I... Like, it was to the point where I literally had no no energy. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything, so I'd... So she'd be like, don't, don't bother coming to training this week, just, just rock up to the game. And then I'd get to the game and, and sometimes I wouldn't warm up because I just didn't have the energy to warm up. And then she would take me for a walk around the oval and, and be like, how are you going today? And I'd cry. Like I just was like constantly crying all the time. And, and then, did you feel like everyone was watching you at that stage because you played for Australia and like it was a public battle? Did you feel like everyone's seeing how you are on that day? Yeah, and it was... It was weird because when I spoke to a lot of the girls after the events and they were just saying that they all knew I wasn't right they, and they were like, wait, they were hoping that someone was going to step in and, and say enough's enough because they could see w like what was happening to me. Um, and then obviously there was one game after um, that I spoke to, to Tom and was trying to have a conversation around it with him and I sort of just was making up shit really I was just like um like oh yeah I think it's burnout I don't have any energy but that was half the stuff that I was experiencing um and then just trying to mask the yeah truth. yeah exactly because I I didn't want to accept that the level that I'd got to and I still felt as though I had a duty to do um and then yeah, it was around Boxing Day after the Boxing Day match, and I got out and um, I went into the change rooms and just sat there. And 
cried and Zoe Goss um, came in and sat with me. She didn't say anything, she just sat with me and I was just crying. And the, all I was talking about was like my breakup, um, like where I was at in my life and like how sad I was. And then I, then I had to obviously like get myself back together because we had to go out and bowl. And I just was like not there, hey, like I was just not present. But I bowled really well. <laughs> it was so weird. Like I was at the top of my game almost like from a, yeah, from a cricketing point of view, but I couldn't be further from being, okay. yeah, yeah, it was so weird. Um, and then after that, I actually had an honest conversation. I, I drove to see the doctor the next day and, and he, and I was telling him all my symptoms and he was like, bolts, it sounds like you're pretty depressed. And I was like you reckon (laughs) I was like yeah I I actually am like I'm really sad because even Christmas like I couldn't even find any joy in that I just remember driving to mum and dad's house with mum and just like crying and there was just this is sorry this is how long after the breakup had happened um so this was December and the breakup had happened in May wow so still seven months or so yeah yeah yeah. And still hurting. Yeah, and, and that's the thing because it was still hurting because I hadn't dealt with it because I had to I went to the UK, then I went to Malaysia, then I went to the West Indies and then oh hey, here's Big Bash, let's drop that in. Mm. And I never had an opportunity to actually process it. Like don't get me wrong, during that time um I was doing some heavy work with my personal psych. Um but it was always, it was more about how to survive the environment rather than let's really start dealing with it. So I just felt, and Tom felt, that we needed to pull me away and really start to get a handle on some of these things. Mm. So how long did you have off from that point? Um, so I took time off in de- uh, late December. Um, I played my last game against the, the Thunder and then I took a break basically from then on um and it was a really slow grind because I just remember as soon as I made that decision like um I couldn't get I couldn't leave the house I was like I was in my pajamas and on the couch and all the all the girls were obviously not they were worried but wanted to make sure I was okay and I couldn't meet anyone like so they had to come to me and um I was just exhausted. It was like my body had finally decided to shut down. Um, and then I was obviously um, between my psych, um, uh, Cricket Australia psych um, and the WACA, they had sort of communicated and were communicating regularly around how I was travelling. Um, it was – the work that I was doing was more with um, my personal psych during that stage because um, – we felt that that was the, the best course of action and it was just a really slow burn. Like it was sort of like, hey, let's, you've got, you've got to do three things today and let's try and tick that off. So it might be like, I walk to the shops to get milk today. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> just like, like life tasks mm-hmm. that I found. Seems difficult at the time. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or like go for a walk. Like I couldn't even run. Like I remember it, um, one of my really good mates, Joey Rotundo, he, he's actually massive in my coming back as well. Um, he tried to take me for a run and I, like, literally couldn't run. Like, it was just, it was so bizarre, like... It sounds like you are emotionally shut down and your body didn't want to operate. Yeah, yeah, and it was really scary because I wasn't sure if I could get out of it and then, I, obviously, stepping away from cricket, like, I wasn't really sure if I was going to get back. So, um, yeah, it took a, it took a long time. And please feel free not to go too deep. You've been very, very honest and raw here. Did you have to then do a whole lot of sort of reflecting and, and try and get out of what the, the sort of what was inside you sort of thing with your psych? Yeah, so I've, I've been seeing a psych. We, we joked about it the other day because we celebrated our four-year anniversary. <laughs> so I've been exposed to that sort of work for a long time and... Um, yeah, I think because I've got such a good relationship with him, like um, I trust him, we were able to sort of really put some things in place. Um, and, and during that time, it was just like dealing with, with the breakup, basically. Um, ne- I really needed to get to a point where 
um, I was as okay as I could be about it. Um, and then I was able to really sort of go, well, cricket's here. Um, my relationship is there. And then where do I want to be as a person? Um, so it was almost like a bit of self-discovery, I guess, over the next six to eight weeks and getting to a point where I could find other avenues that were going to bring joy and that cricket wasn't that distraction or I didn't have that dependency on it to, I guess, in a way, provide myself worth. Mm. So did you find new hobbies or interests or things that gave you joy? Yeah, so I had been talking about getting into yoga for years and then... I finally decided to do a six-week beginner course with Barbie, actually, and um, I had that real commitment to do it, and I think having someone else do it with me, like, meant that I couldn't let her down, and then we, yeah, we did the six-week course, and then we ended up um, continuing on, and yoga for me was, like, it was amazing, it was like a space, it's just like a room full of people you don't even know, but you're finding absolute peace and a connection yeah Yeah. like a spiritual connection and um i always think that i'm like pretty spiritual so things like that and and breathing and moving and even um some form of meditation um was just really therapeutic and i remember early doors when i was still experiencing and and talking about my my breakup i'd go to yoga and because it was so empowering i would find myself kind of crying during during a meditative state or um so all my real raw emotions were coming out in that sort of form and it was almost like a healing process mm. for me and and then rather it, than suppressing them for yeah. seven months that you'd done on tour you were able to let them out yeah and i and, and letting it out in a form of complete strangers was the most bizarre safe, thing ever yeah. yeah but it just felt safe yeah. like it was weird yeah, yeah. um is that something you continue to practice now yeah it is um and i think at the moment I'm probably a little bit off the radar with it and to me this is what happens so I've created this life and I've, I've developed new hobbies and new passions and then it's like okay I want I love this world but this is like a bit of a euphoric state at the moment um, it worked really well in terms of getting me back on track but I want this and I want it in reality and reality for me is playing cricket at the highest level um, fulfilling my job um, and I'm going to be busy I'm going to be away a lot like what does it look like how can I actually bring both worlds together and I've been guilty of over the last probably couple of months that I haven't I haven't done it. it yeah and I haven't reconnected with it in a way that I would and I'm always finding excuses and I know when this starts happening that I'm going down that path of all right well crickets become everything again or making excuses I'm too tired or I can't do this and and then it becomes a little bit of a vicious cycle Mm. so um, every every now and then like you know I'd sort of pinpoint one of the girls that I know will do it and I have that commitment again get accountable yep yep and given the situation in the world at the moment with coronavirus and you were saying just before we started that everything shut down for Cricket Australia you've got nine weeks or so now at minimum, yep. now is probably a good time to commit <laughs> yeah. yourself if you're allowed to go or maybe some home practices. And we had Cameron Bancroft on this um, podcast last month and he spoke about how yoga really helped him find himself and, and his healing process with the sort of the trauma and things he, he'd been through. Um, so where are you at now? How are you feeling now? Are you, are you feeling like you're well and you're on track? And obviously mental health is a, is a beast that can rear its head at any stage, but are you feeling like you're going okay? Yeah, I think um, for me it was about getting some consistency and, and obviously um, during that stage I um, started medication as well. So, you know, I have to be accountable every day and I have to have some sort of um, routine to be able to facilitate the work that I've done. And so for me, you know, I need to I need to be doing it at the same time every day. And, and then little things that I've sort of picked up is... Um, you know, like I like exercising and socialising and, and doing all those things because they, and with people outside of cricket, because that actually gives me um, joy and, and good energy. And I think with where I'm at at the moment, I'm pretty exhausted from the season. It's been a long season. Um, it's been testing. Um, you know, when I think back to, um, you know, the start of the season, I was 
making my comeback from taking time off and I was going on an Ashes tour to England and the Ashes tour did not uh, go the way that I wanted to go. So, you know, I sort of came back from that tour at a crossroads of where my cricket was at. So I sort of experienced that. And then, um, you know, during that time I had sort of not broken down again, but slightly gone backwards. And even throughout the season, I definitely was experiencing um, different symptoms around my mental health. And I think the thing with where it's at, because um, I've been so open and started to, to feel and accept where I'm at, um, a lot of these things, I now have knowledge that is happening. And, and awareness of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then I'm still trying to find ways to best course of management and and when it does, things do get overwhelming or I do go into my shell or I start having thoughts like, like what is the way to actually help? Um, and particularly when it happens around cricket, like what does that look like? And I think it's, a, it's an evolving beast and it's something that I don't think you ever have the right answers, but it's just around self-awareness and, and making sure that I've got good networks and good processes in place to be able to deal with it. Um, and is it easier knowing that you've been through it and come out the other side? Because I suppose sometimes the uncertainty of, like you say, when you took time off and you thought, am I ever going to play again? Am I ever going to be able to run and do these things again? Does it get, is it a bit easier knowing that you can get through it? Yeah, definitely. And I think me knowing and experiencing what that is versus, for instance, like this week, um, our season's done and I'm feeling flat, lethargic and going, well, it's... It's actually not my mental health. Um, it's been a long year and my body's just gone. I need a break um, versus where I was 12 months ago. So mm. being able to separate the two and, and not have a catastrophic mindset where I go, I'm falling back down there. Um, but actually being able to deal with real life stuff as well. Because mm. um, I think, you know, over the next 12 months, it could be a really interesting time. And um, am I... At, you know, healthy enough to, to be able to deal with some of that stuff. And I think now I'm at a position where I can actually deal with it. Great to hear. And well done for being so open and honest. Thank you for sharing that with all of our sort of viewers and listeners and with me. Um, well done for coming out because um, people like you do inspire others to go and get themselves better and get the treatment they need. So you should be really sort of proud of, of what you've done. Um, knowing what you know now and having lived through what you've lived through and a couple of sort of times times you've stepped away from cricket if you're advising your 15 year old self or a young sort of viewer or listener out there what would you what would your advice be to someone who loves cricket wants to be the best but um yeah that was a it could be anything really it's really hard because at that age you're so passionate and you're so driven to want to achieve like high success and um you know you're really ambitious as well and there's not too many times that you feel like you can't achieve it but I think um if I was talking to myself back then I would I would say don't don't take things so seriously I think um I would want to build a life away from the game so that you know when I'm there I'm giving everything but I'm able to step back into who I am as a person and I think um the mistake that I made is I identified myself through cricket and everything became about cricket um and I just really lost sight of my other interests and who I was as a person so I think it's it's great to be ambitious and it's great to you know want to succeed and, and if you want to play for Australia or whatever the highest level looks like you, you can definitely achieve that but sustainable success is all about finding the right balance and I think the right balance for yourself as a person is really important. Mm, absolutely. And you say there about your identity as a cricketer. Did you think when you got runs you're a good person and when you didn't get runs, oh, I'm no good at this, I'm no good at life? Yeah, I, I actually did a um, talk around mental health um, a few weeks ago and I actually um, sort of said that there was these two feelings that and emotions that I would experience in cricket and one is when... I made runs, I was like, hell yeah, how good am I? And um, like that was my way that I would like value myself and my worth. And, um, and then the other one was when you get out for no runs and you're walking off 
And I said to I said to the people, I was just like, the feeling of walking off when you don't score any runs and you're mentally not well, it feels like the the grass and everything is just sucking you down from underneath and that you actually can't escape and it's the feeling of embarrassment um, and you're no good and why why are you playing this sport like why why do you continue to put yourself through this like all these emotions and like it's just so overwhelming and that's only and that's from like making no runs. Mm. <laughs> it's crazy when you think about it. Yeah, it's just a yeah, game. Yeah, 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 but I get so consumed by it. Yeah, and I think for me, like, because it is my career and a lot of how I get reviewed and whether I have a job the next year is performance related and mm. it's a really hard um, thing to manage because you lose sight of it being a game and your passion because it becomes so much more. Mm-hmm. So do you now, have you learned to be level? Regardless of a good day or a bad day, do you try and stay quite emotionally level, try and speak to yourself in the same way? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I haven't played for Australia for a while now, but I've been okay with that and I feel as though I've found um, pleasure in, in just playing the sport again and, and being part of a team and... Um, and just take taking it for what it is, mm. and I think not placing so much emphasis on results and personal personal results, I think, really helped because, um, yeah, in that state and how I was operating, yeah, it was it contributed to my success, no doubt about it, because I was exceptionally driven, um, but it was also had a detrimental effect to probably my health and and then my longevity of the game. Mm. Well, regardless if you play for Australia again or not, and I'm sure you will, uh, you should be very proud of what you've done so far. Um, just, I spoke to you just before, I think there's a great podcast that I'll share in this show notes where um, a guy called Ben Crow, who's a performance mentor, um, he's mentored Ash Barty and he talks about exactly what you've just spoken about, where as an athlete, you've got to try and um, take your identity away from you as an athlete and say, okay, when I'm not performing, that's okay, I'm still a person, I'm still a a daughter, a sister, a friend, a colleague, whatever, not just a cricketer, not just a tennis player in Ash Barty's. And what he, the work he did with Ash Barty, um, from what it seems, has really taken her game to a new level because she can step on the court and be a tennis player and when she's off the court she can be Ash Barty, the, the kind, caring person. And that, I think, is a great sort of lesson for us all and I'll, I'll share that podcast with you and, and the, the viewers. Now, this season... I assume one of the great experiences of your career was winning the WNCL for the first time with, with Western Australia. You played a big role in that. You were the player of the match, 67 and 3 for 34 in the final. You were the player of the tournament, most runs, and five half centuries in nine hits, third most wickets, dominating. You must have been playing some of your best career, cricket of your career at that point. Yeah, I I feel as though where my cricket's at at the moment, it's the best I've Played probably in my whole career, and I think um, I don't know what I put it down to. I, I mean, I work exceptionally hard at training, um, even in the nets. I, you know, I, I speak to a lot of the girls about there's there's doing individual skill, and that's about working on something different. But when you're doing competitive nets, like you're trying to get into the same mindset and set the same standards as you would as if you're playing. And I think for me is I sort of was able to drive really high standards for myself at training and then I was seeing results in the games because my concentration, my processes, everything was becoming just second nature. So you were practicing more often than you would have in the past, the game mindset. Yep, yep. So 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 often I would be quite emotional in the nets and probably just try 50 di- different things and all focus on technique. Or just focusing on, I, I want to try and hit this ball for six, or I want to do this, and losing sight of actually how to train properly and, and smartly. And I think, um, you know, coming in a little bit later, um, batting at four was a different role that I've been exposed to. Um, I've been opening my whole career, and I think um, we saw value and placing me in that role as a bit of experience um, to lengthen our batting order. And I think for me, um, it just really suited me. Um, I really enjoyed it and I sort of was able to have a bigger effect on the games. 
Um, and then in terms of bowling, I, I, I bowl in the nets and that's all I do. I don't do any technical work. I'm just sort of someone that loves to get in the contest. And one thing that I've noticed about me in the last little bit is my ability to be competitive again and be in the contest and not shy away from being challenged. Whereas when I was sort of battling hard, I almost wanted to revert um, back to um, you know bad sort of processes and go actually no nah, like I don't want to be challenged yeah, yeah. and like th- Take the easy option. yeah yeah and I think I I built it my competitive spirit back and and I think that was what I sort of saw in my performances because when I was when I was there I was trying to do whatever the team needed me to do mm-hmm. um, and even in club cricket like. For, for so long I used to disregard club cricket and I was like it's crap like um, the standards like waste of my time like and then during my transition back into cricket it was done through club cricket last season after my time off and I just had this new feeling towards club cricket and cricket in a sense and like I go back to club cricket now and normally I'd be like oh, I'm going to try and whack this person and this is crap but I'm like no nah, like I'm I'm winning a game of cricket for Subi. Like, what do I need to do? Like, I sort of have the same, the same standards. Doesn't matter what level, and that never used to be what I was about. And that's probably why there's no coincidence that you're playing some of your best cricket of your career. You're not changing day in day out. You're just driving high standards and being super consistent. Whether it's in the nets, whether it's in a club game, or whether it's in a state game, you're you're really really consistent and. Something that I talk about with my athletes, something I learned from Chris Rogers, is about performance zone and learning zone. So like when you're doing your technical work, your skill-based stuff you, with your, your coach, let's say you might be focusing a fair bit on technique and learning, thinking about, and Bangers spoke about thinking and feeling. And then when you're training with against bowlers or you might separate another session against the side and say, right, this is performance zone. I'm not going to think technique. I just want to practice my mental and emotional skills of focusing. And I think that's so underrated in the, mo- in the modern game. Yeah, massive. I remember um, last week uh, at state training, we had some young girls join us and um, our coach had paired us up with a, sort of a senior and a junior. And I was having um, a conversation with a young girl called Sonia Yadav. And um, there was four rotations. In our first rotation, we were on the, the bowling machine. And I said, oh, let's just like, this rotation's yours what do you want to work on? Um, she wanted to work on her, her driving. So she was quite specific and we talked a little bit of technical um, and then that rotation was done and we were going into three rotations of live net, so we're facing bowlers. And the thing that I said to her, what you've just done then, great, but now we're coming into the live nets and this is where you actually practice your instinctive behaviours and your processes and whatever you're thinking about technical-wise, just let it go. All you need to focus on is what's happening right ahead of you. And I think that's something that I used to really struggle with when I was a younger player is I'd go into live nets or in games and I'd be thinking about technique. Mm-hmm. And, and I think I, I think almost every cricketer has probably had periods or most of their career like that. And I think the very best are the ones that are able to trust their technique and just play. Yeah, yeah. And I experienced it this year because I, I came back from the Ashes and I was like, I don't know how to bat. I keep nicking off, like, what is going on? And then I had, then I tried holding my bat up. And then I was playing practice games and the whole time I was thinking when I was holding my bat up. So I'm facing, like, live, like, this is gameplay. And I'm thinking about, oh, this doesn't feel right. Should I hold it there, there? And I'm like, how the hell am I supposed to perform if all I'm worrying about is how I'm holding my bat? You've got a moving ball at pace and you're trying to make a decision and you're thinking about what's going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a dangerous place to be. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, I think you're not focusing. You can't really, like, narrow your focus in on the ball and you just always overcomplicate. Like, that's what I've always found. Absolutely. Now, so at the highest level, what percentage do you think is, is mental and what percentage is technical for your success? Um, I think when you get to sort of playing for Australia, um, you, your game's pretty sound. I think it's more mental than anything um, and it's preparation. So I think, um, you know, every every player's got the skill set to be able to, to, to play at that level, um, but it's how to challenge yourself in different environments where you're going to be put under pressure and you're going to have to develop the, the mental strategies to be able to perform. Mm. Um, and preparation is the biggest key. I think what I've found over 
it is how hard you have to train and, and the standards you set and, and how fit you need to be um, to play for Australia. And, you know, my preparation was so um, so massive um, in my success, you know, to the point where I would, um, you know, I'd look at bowlers that I would come up against and I'd write down my plans. And, and then that used to be me when I needed, like, my T's crossed my eyes dotted, like, and then now I'm a little bit more relaxed and going well it's not really so much about what's happening down there it's like what what can I control Mm -hmm. as a player and Mm -hmm. and am I prepared like have have I done x y and z like do I feel like I'm I'm ready to go Mm -hmm. so it doesn't really become so much about yeah what's happening down the other end and that again is probably why you're playing some of your best because you're discovering what you need to do to get you at your best yeah rather than worrying about what they're doing and everyone's different some people love Michael Klinger on this podcast said that he used to analyse and watch the whole 20 overs and try and learn when certain bowlers bowl a slower ball and this and that and other people don't like doing that so it's it's for any listeners or viewers it's all about understanding trying different things because you won't know unless you try things but trying and then working out what works best for you and obviously there's no coincidence that you're playing your best cricket and hopefully that'll carry on for the next yeah. however many years <laughs> so how do you now going into your mindset on game day but how do you deal with any nerves or anxiety or stress or worries that you have on on sort of game day or any performances yeah i think um you know it's making that um differentiation between nerves that i'm excited and nerves that i'm anxious because i haven't prepared and I think um, that's a pretty easy thing for me to acknowledge. Like if it's nerves and excited, like that's a good thing. Mm. Um, and, and not being scared of it. Yeah, and, and going, you know, like, you know, I'm not going to be in the same situation that I was last week. I'm going to be in a completely different one. Can I can control my emotions enough to be able to handle that? Um, in, am I in a good space? Generally, I, I like to get to the to the ground and make myself a coffee and and go for a walk Um, before I used to create so much anxiety around I needed to get to the ground I needed to have a hit I needed to do this I need to do that 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 and it was just like 50 things before the game even started and I was like exhausted and I'm like what the hell is that like so did you have to reflect and say is this something you've been through you just sort of it's just you've just naturally progressed to coffee walk or did you sit down and say, this is too much? Yeah, I, I worked through it a lot with my, my psych um, and spoke a little bit about, well, what's actually, what's actually healthy and what's not. Um, and being okay that not everything is going to go to plan because he used to say to me, because um, we do talk a little bit about performance in cricket and then obviously like I use him for personal stuff, but when we were talking performance... He would he would be like, so you want to have a hit? And I'm like, yeah, I need to have a hit before I go out to bat. And he's like, well, does it matter when you have it? And I was like, well, I've always had it when I get up to the to the ground. And he's like, well, what happens if you bowl first? And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know. Like, I just... You were just stuck in yeah, what you thought you had, yeah, the routine you had to do. Yeah, and, um, and then I started to... It was during Big Bash I became a, a lot more flexible and developed really healthy processes because I was like... It's T20 cricket. Like, you don't know. Like, you actually, there's so much more un- uncertainty in that format in terms of performance than 50 over. Mm. So I was just like, let's in- let's actually enjoy the experience and not create it to be a monster that it was starting to become. So, mm. yeah, I'd get to the ground, I'd sit down, have a coffee and have a chat with someone else who likes to do that. And then... So you're getting there quite early still, and but you're just giving yourself a lot more flexibility yep. simplifying things and not rushing so much yeah and then i'd be like yeah i do want to have a hit but you know what i'll have a hit either if i feel like it or if it's before before batting innings so you know all this season was all about just being really fluid um, and flexible i guess and making sure that i was getting myself in a really relaxed state of mind mm. I, the one thing that i do like to do is i like to go out and have a bowl because mm. bowling for me is a lot harder than batting so mm. I like to I like to feel how I'm bowling on on the day, so that's something that I do like to do. Mm. Um, 
which is really weird because it's got nothing obviously to do with batting and that's my primary role. <laughs> but being an all-rounder does help. It yeah. takes pressure off your batting, doesn't it? Yeah. And the yeah. more you start the ball probably is taking a bit of pressure off your batting. Yeah, and I think I've always been someone that I want to impact the game. I want to impose myself. And I think being able to bowl and have a different string to my bow means that, yeah, like you say, like if, if it doesn't come off with a bat, like I still have an opportunity with the ball to change the game. Um, and it's something that is really challenging for me because... Um, it doesn't come naturally and I have to find a way when I am having an off day and it doesn't feel right I have to find a way to, to get through it but I feel as though like I've built up some good processes to be able to do things differently now mm. um, and I just I just really enjoyed it to mm. be honest yeah yeah I know that I've sort of spent most of my career as a batter but in recent years I've sort of transitioned into an all-rounder or even more of a bowler and it's just such a I find it a good new challenge it's like a new challenge it's like yep. something that's so exciting now moving into your pre-ball routine or your post-ball um, then into your pre-ball what is there something particular you do something specific you do or do you just sort of whatever happens on the day um, when I'm like really honed in on my processes and this is generally like if it's one day my first 20 balls are like really important to me and that's establishing really good processes and, and concentration. So for me, um, it's a matter of, you know, when I come out, I mark, I mark my crease and then I sort of just sort of step back and just take a bit of t extra time and sort of make them wait for me. And then um, from then on in, after every ball, I'll sort of step away to um, square leg, just walk out and then walk back in. And I normally do this thing with my grip, which I wasn't aware of until our Wacker Sports site said when we started talking about processes, when I was getting overwhelmed, particularly in T20, what I can control. And he's like, oh, do you know that you actually reset yourself beautifully before every ball? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, you do something with your grip to almost go, yep. And then you face up. And I was like, oh, wow. And that's just something that I've done. Like, so I walked a square leg. I do my grip and then I face up um, and that's just something that is repetitive and then once I start getting in the zone and everything's just like flowing it just happens um, naturally but in my first 20 balls I'm really starting trying to establish myself I have to be really um, on it and then so you're focusing on doing that that grip thing and that'll just recenter you refocus you do you have any thoughts as the bowlers running in do you have any trigger words or cues or do you just try and be as free and let it, let it just play the only thing that i'm thinking about is just hit hit straight and um that's just something that i've sort of tried to instill into my game and it's been really effective this year is like when i'm coming in doesn't matter I'll, I'll always react to the short ball but for me it's like get on the front foot and hit straight and mm. and look to drive um when i get really overwhelmed and Sometimes T20 is a bit like that. Situations can get quite big. Um, I sort of, to step back out, we sort of did a bit of work with the, the Wacker Psych on, um, you know, attention in and attention out. So when I'm not facing up, it's focusing on stuff around the ground. So it might just be like, oh, there's a flag over there or look at that tree or, you know, or oh, there's a person that's wearing a red shirt. Just observing yeah. things going on. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then going, yep. Okay, and now attention back in, what are my processes? And then focusing on the ball. So there's a, a plenty of things that I've probably um, developed, you know, so far over my career that, yeah, consistency is the key. So the more consistent I became with it, I guess it's reflective of how my performances have gone. Exactly. If you're practicing in the nets yep. and regularly, it's much easier to do in the game. Well, so I say to the girls, like, when I go into the nets, I'm batting as if I am, like, you're not getting me out. I'm looking to score, but everything that I practice in the nets is reflective of how I go about it in a game. How do you do that when there's four bowlers and instead of having 25 seconds in between balls or 17 seconds, there's a bowler waiting at the top of their mark? Are you just condensing your process to be a little bit similar but a little bit quicker? Yeah, I think so. But also, um, you know, I never want to, as a batter, I never want to feel rushed and I never... Even if I only end up facing, say, like four balls in that rotation because you're generally batting with someone. So, um, you know, you might not get to face... Like, it doesn't bother me because I'm like, this could happen in a game. I could get stuck down one end. And how am I going to deal with that? Like, 
how am I going to handle that? I haven't faced a ball in 15 balls, but now I'm back on and this bowl is bowling really well. Like, how am I switching on? So mm. everything is not – like, when I get to live nets, it becomes less about what I need but about – how, how it's actually going to look in a, in a game and, mm. and feel. Mm. And being adaptable, and that's a very mature way to look at things. And I'm sure that's not how you've always been. Nah, nah, no, no way. I'd be like, any danger if you like getting off strike so mm. I can have a hit. Like. Yeah, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. But that's, that's the way most people, Yeah. That most people, it's about you and what you need. But I think the way you're approaching it is very mature. And it's, it's a lesson for any young players that, um, yes, you, you may face... 10 less balls, and I often say this, we want quality over quantity. We get quantity anyway if we're training hard, yeah. but we've got to make sure we're getting quality. Now, we could talk all day, but we're <laughs> going to have to sort of keep the conversation progressing. Um, tell me about your thoughts on the 2020 World Cup and what that means for women's cricket moving forward and, and how, how has that affected you? How has that inspired you um, for your game, take your game to the next level? Yeah, well, I actually went over and, and watched it and I was just... I was just blown away, to be honest. I had so many emotions. Like One was like, I was bloody jealous. I wish I was a part of it. Two, I was like, this is a monumental day in, in women's, women's sport, let alone women's cricket. And then it was just the amount of um, exposure. Like, I, I was a little bit naive, the whole World Cup going, you know, they were talking about feel the G and we're going to get this many people. And I was like, well, I don't know. Like, I've... You know, I've played. I've played for Australia. I'm just not sure there's that interest. Um, but Katy Perry never played before our game, so. <laughs> um, but it was just an unbelievable day, and and what was made even better was the brand of cricket that the girls played. I mm. think, Healy and Nones came out and just literally put on a show, and I think, that was exactly everything that we as a unit have been training and playing and um, putting into everything was literally that showcase that the girls put on and I was just so so thrilled that they were able to do it but also under you know significant pressure like mm. they they didn't have it their own way throughout the whole tournament and then to to produce when it mattered in front of over 80,000 people was unbelievable um, what it seemed like and what I've read about is getting to the final was the big pressure for yeah me. and you know that the girls in the group far better than I do but once they were there, that was then, right, let's just have fun and celebrate. Whereas maybe the Indians were like, we've got to win, we've got to win. And that allowed them to then just go and showcase all that work and all that skill that they've got. Yeah, I think so. It was it was really stressful. I mean, I, I caught up with a few of them when they came to Perth and speaking to Modi after the Sri Lankan game. And, you know, there was everyone was nervous. And, um, you know, that semi-final could have been a really different, like, it just could have affected their whole campaign. But... I think what's made them so, so successful over a long period of time is just their ability to absorb it, get really insular and um, in terms of as a unit and not buy into any external noise. And I think, um, you know, they would have been having some pretty honest conversations of, around um, how they were performing and how they expected to be better. And I think once they found out that they were going to the final, I think you're totally right in saying that they actually just released the shackles and became free and just played played cricket, mm, you know? Mm. And what do you think it's going to do for girls cricket around the world? Oh, they're just going to they're just going to say something like that and just go, geez, I want to be a part of that. And I, I just think um, more girls playing the sport is definitely going to come from it. And they can see the heights that you can you can get to like to be able to experience that playing potentially in front of 80,000 um how amazing would that be um and then to see some of those girls um smiling and enjoying um having fun out there as well I think it just goes to show that if if it's something that you want to be involved with um you know these are all the feelings that you can sort of experience Mm. and has it lighted a a, a sort of flame in you to try and get back in the Aussie team and play in front of a packed house one day? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how I would have handled it. <laughs> I think I, I would have really enjoyed um, the fielding. I think batting, it, your processes and everything would have been tested and, um, you know, all the players would have been feeling the pressure, but I guess that's what you've been training and preparing for. And I think for me, on the horizons of 50 over World Cup in New Zealand um, in March next year, so, you know, um, I had... We semi-finals in the 2017 World Cup. We lost to to India, and um, you know that's still 
that still affects me. And, you know, to have an opportunity to potentially, um, you know, be involved in that, I think that's sort of igniting a little bit of passion back into playing at that level. Awesome, awesome. Well, we wish you the best of luck for that. Now, final few questions. What's common in the best players that you've seen you played with and against some of the best players in, in the game? What's common in the best players you've seen? Um, well, probably two of the, well, I'd say three of the best players that I've probably played with is um, Elise Perry, Meg Lanning, and I'm going to throw Beth Mooney into there. And I think um, the thing that makes Beth and um, Elise exceptional cricketers is their training and preparation. Um, Moon's hits that many balls. And same as Pez, she's, you know, they're always the last ones in the nets. They're really honing into their skill. Um, and I think on the flip side, Meg, what makes her such a great player is she knows when to really train hard and it'll be about quantity and versus, nah, I'm, I'm actually tracking okay, I'm going to pull back and I'm going to go do something else. Or, um, you know, it didn't come off today, but I'm not going to read too much into that. I'm going to have another opportunity. So I think, you know, both are successful in their own rights, but both have very different ways of going about it. So I think, um, you know, when, when you get to that level, you're obviously there because um, of, your, of your skill. Um, but then, like I said, it becomes about knowing personally what you need to do. If you need to hit a lot of balls because that makes you perform better, then there's two players that do that and um, proofs in the pudding. Or if you're someone that is comfortable with your preparation and actually, you know, needs to go and do something else, go play golf. Like Heels loves playing golf. Go play golf, do something different because if that's going to freshen you up and you're going to perform, then great. So I think it's knowing yourself what you need to do um, and I guess what success looks like. Yeah, absolutely. What's next for you? Um, we're, well, we're currently on a nine-week player leave um, with this whole virus. So um, for me, at the moment, cricket's done and dusted. Um, you know, I think on, on the horizon like I've sort of alluded to before, is that, that World Cup next year. And I think if it's something that I'm really serious about wanting to be a part of, I think um, you know, I'm going to have to start to, to really put some things in place to be able to put myself in that position. Um, I'm going to celebrate this season. I think um, there's been some really great um, team success winning the, the WNCL title. And, and obviously personally to, to finish the season in the fashion I did after um, my Ashes campaign, um, it's probably something I didn't think I, I would get back to and achieve. So, um, you know, I'm definitely going to reflect on that. But, yeah, like I said, over this next little bit, I'm going to work on some things again for me and find some other passions outside of cricket and, and really hone in on, on that life away and keep, keep um, you know, nutting out what my identity looks away from sport. Awesome, awesome. Now, why do you play cricket? Why do I play cricket? That's a really good question, actually. Why do I play cricket? It's just something about it. Like, it's just so challenging. Like, for me, I play cricket because I love making runs, like, and I love fielding. And it's just, I know everyone's like, oh, I can't believe you enjoy, like, fielding for, like, three hours and you enjoy playing for six hours. But I'm like, I just love it. Like, I just do. Like, I just feel like in, when I'm fielding and stuff, like, it's not just about, oh, I need the ball in my hand. It's just the, the humour and the banter between everyone um, you know, you're under pressure. How do you deal with it? Um, and then as batting, like, I just love constructing an innings. I feel sometimes, like, on the weekend I was playing club and I would have been, like, three off 20, going any danger, just get out, you're embarrassing yourself. <laughs> and then, like, working your way through that and then finishing up and winning a game in cricket for your club and, and then you just, like, you, you reflect on that and you go, oh, like, what did I do? Like, how did I get through that? And did I learn something from that? I think that's the biggest thing. Like, I just feel like every game of cricket I'm playing, I'm continually learning and, you know, I'm 31 now and I'm, I'm still finding things out that I didn't think I knew about the game. Mm, amazing. And again, that's why you're having such a great time now. You've got all that experience behind you and it's, you can tell just from that answer yeah. how much you love it. So yeah. it's great to see you, you're at that place. Before I ask my final question, where can people follow you? Where can our audience um, stay up to date with you or, or check in and see where you're at you're on social media? Oh, great. That's a, that's a tough one because that was part of actually my um, uh, management plan as I went off social media platforms um, 
because I need a little bit of space away from that. And yeah, I guess it's it's hard because I I feel like people can't really um, catch up or um, see 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 what I'm up to. But I haven't really established how how that looks for me at the moment. Yeah. Um, it's definitely something that I I've thought about. Yeah. But I guess doing things like this and and being able to talk open and honestly yeah. um, is probably like a good thing that. You know, I, I wouldn't do it if I didn't want to do it. Yeah, well, you need your space, so you do what you've got to do. And we'll, uh, hopefully all the viewers and who will be inspired by this and the, the listeners will just be able to um, follow your career as it progresses. Now, final question for everyone that comes on this podcast is what's your definition of success? Oh, definition of success. Mm. That is, yeah, what a question, hey? Um, okay, I definition of success, I think for me is doing something and even if you even if you fail at it um giving it another crack and i guess still to me still finding joy in doing that i think sometimes when we as people fail or we experience hardship um we resort back to bad habits or we withdraw from that i think what success looks like is experiencing all that still being able to reflect give it another crack and find find more joy in it amazing amazing <laughs> what a great answer bolts Mate, well done thank you very thank much, you very for, much having for having it uh, for coming on no we've, thanks for having me broken the rules and we've done a handshake oh yeah like where's the dead old <laughs> yeah. um, thank you so much for your honesty um thank you for sharing your journey um i've really enjoyed chatting and could have chatted for a lot longer but um I'm sure our listeners and our viewers have learned a lot, have been inspired and motivated, and hopefully, if anyone out there is struggling, um, that you've given them some inspiration to go and sort of get some help and, and make themselves feel better. So thank you for everything, and we wish you all the best for the rest of your career and beyond. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cheers.